Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar today in association with the global medical technology company BD and today we're going to be discussing sepsis and its link and role with antimicrobial resistance and the stewardship uh, of that. We've got some excellent guests here this afternoon to discuss these issues. Uh, we've got Ron Daniels who's the Chief Executive of the UK Sepsis Trust and Global Sepsis Alliance. We've got Professor Peter Wilson, consultant microbiologist from UCLH, and we've got John Welsh, a nurse consultant also at UCLH and past, pre, past ex-president of the International Society for Rapid Response. So let's get straight into it. Uh, gentlemen, thanks for joining us today on what must be, a, uh, well, I'm told, one of the biggest issues facing uh, the NHS is around antimicrobial resistance and treating sepsis and the deteriorating patient. And I wanted to start off by, first of all, just asking each of you to sort of reflect on where we are uh, on these issues. And in particular, I saw the recent official statistics from uh, NHS Digital, I believe, around the cases of sepsis that we're, we're now getting reported, uh, he emphasis on the word reported. Um, but according to the data, we've got uh, the numbers have risen from 350,000, sorry, ri they've increased to 350,000 cases from 169 in 2015-16. So does that represent a growing problem or are we just more aware and we're reporting these problems better. So, John, can I start with yourself? Hmm. So, um, I think we're still getting our heads around how to identify and measure sepsis, and I don't know whether either of those numbers is accurate. Um, what we see at the sharp end, perhaps in, in intensive care, are obviously the patients that are thought sick enough and uh, amenable to treatment who end up there. And that would be a much, much smaller number than the ones that you've just quoted. So either the bigger number is composed of people who um, uh, aren't sick enough to need aggressive intensive care treatment, um, or they are composed of people who it's thought it would be inappropriate to treat so aggressively. And we do need to recognise that the people most susceptible are elderly, frail people who might not necessarily get a benefit from, from aggressive treatment. And that's one of our jobs, I think, to, to try and work out how to differentiate those, those two groups. Mm. Yeah, Peter, from your perspective, how, how do you um, assess the current situation? Uh, um, it's very mixed. Uh, on the one hand, we are clearly more successful now in keeping people alive for longer and um, we are as microbiologists seeing more and more patients with septicemia bacteremia very more complicated difficult clinical problems to deal with and that's definitely increasing our workload is definitely increasing um, is that a real increase per head of population very, it's, it's quite difficult to say and, and certainly I am aware of patients being wrongly identified as having sepsis um, and that is really quite common. Um, for example, last week we had a whole series of obstetric patients brought to us in the hospital, brought to the microbiology department saying, look, these have all triggered the sepsis criteria. But actually, when you look at them, none of them had any bacteremia or any other evidence of infection from a microbiological point of view. So I think it is an extremely difficult area to be dogmatic about. Yeah. Um, Ron, give us your perspective. I know you've been doing some excellent work in the last few years raising awareness of sepsis, and the figures seem to be suggestive rises, and Peter is talking of seeing more patients like that. What's your view of where we are? So I think... There's been some excellent points made. I think to John's point around the fact that some of these larger group of patients, if you like, the denominator number from the existing data, may be patients in whom escalation to critical care might be inappropriate, but that doesn't mean that implementing the basics of care, which may or may not include antimicrobial therapy, would also be inappropriate. I think we have seen, and we're, we're all aware that numbers in this country as well as in others are rising. And I think most experts agree that the most likely single contribu contributor to that is increased awareness, increased consistency of medical documenting, increased coding as a result of that. 
But we have to also be mindful, for example, in England that our population has grown tangibly. Our population is ageing. Our population now expects more and more invasive things to be done to them at more and more extremes of life and with greater comorbidities. We're getting better at saving very sick, ex-premature neonates who are also very prone to developing sepsis. And I think the, the component of this that certainly the politicians are slightly unkeen to address is that it's probable also that there's a degree of contribution that we can't yet measure from antimicrobial resistance in that patients who develop simple infections in the community if their initial therapy is ineffective against that pathogen, it's quite possible that that will develop into a protracted or complicated infection, which will increase the risk of sepsis developing. And, and can, can I just uh, follow up with yourself? That, so you, you have um, led the charge in many ways. I know lots of other people have as well around raising awareness of this and, and, and getting uh, action on sepsis. We know it, it kills a a huge amount of people, isn't it? I think it's one of the biggest killers after several many sort of well-known diseases. Um, but of course, the, I've seen equally a lot of clinical sort of pushback mm. to suggest that clinicians feel in one sense that they're being required to follow a protocol almost very quickly within, you know, within the hour uh, delivery of, of uh, antibiotics, etc. that that is, is actually in some cases inappropriate. What, what do you say to that? that there's a tension there perhaps. I think there's a perceived tension, but the reality is we have never intended to create a situation, and in fact we haven't created a situation where antibiotics are given out willy-nilly to anyone with a whiffed infection. There was, with the previous sepsis definition, a drift from hospitals in England towards giving patients with the systemic inflammatory response syndrome as a consequence of infection broad-spectrum antimicrobials. Zero evidence, and so we implemented the concept of red flag sepsis to try to tighten the group who were going to be delivered those antibiotics. There's now a drift, gradually, among some organisations toward treating everyone with a national early warning score that's elevated in the context of infection as sepsis and delivering broad-spectrum antimicrobials to those. We're equally, equally alarmed by that. The reality is we've got a hugely heterogeneous cohort of patients. There's some recent work from the United States that suggests that there are different phenotypes amongst this, and this has been alluded to, that there are some patients who have a technical definition of sepsis in whom we can almost certainly wait before administering antimicrobials. There are some patients who, in whom we probably can't wait, but at the moment we're very poor at distinguishing who sits in which uh, end of the spectrum, and therefore we tend to adopt a blunder branch blunderbuss approach to antibiotics yeah uh, peter from your expertise uh, the uh, the blunderbuss ab- approach to, uh, is that uh, is how big an issue is that should how worried should we be about that i think we should be really worried because certainly in the last two years i've seen a seed change in the antimicrobial resistance of uh, patients coming into the hospital um, whereas we used to be able to treat urinary infections with simple antibiotics. Now, in over half of them, we're having to give what we would have thought to be third or fourth line antibiotics. We're rapidly running out of alternatives. I mean, I'm quite where the end process of this is going to go. I'm not sure. All I can say is it's getting worse from year to year. So anything that would encourage more use of the very broad spectrum antibiotics is going to make that situation worse, particularly if they're given inappropriately. So my plea would be that, yes, you use the broad-spectrum antibiotics, but you use them when they are indicated, when it is actually a bacteremia that you're dealing with. And, of course, that means you've got to be, we've got to get better with our diagnosis. So can I just follow up then? The, the current protocols that we have, um, are they... Uh, sufficiently targeted and smart in the way that you're describing or or are they uh, actually contributing to the problem? Well, not at the moment. I mean, in about 40% of the cases where broad-spectrum antibiotics are given, the patient hasn't actually got sepsis or, or, or an infection, a bacterial infection anyway. They may have fungal, they may have viral, and they may have no infection. and It's actually an, another disease mimicking it. And we've really got to get better on on picking out those patients because at the moment we're wasting a lot of antibiotic and that is adding to the antibiotic load that these organisms see in their emergence of resistance. Mm. Uh, John, in 
in the intensive care departments that you've worked in and your expertise, when you hear Peter say, say this, uh, uh, for nurses at your level and those beneath you on the wards doing this work, it's, uh, it's incredibly hard for them to differentiate those patients, isn't it? To be smart about that when they've got processes and managers behind them saying, follow this protocol follow this tick box approach. Am I, am I being a bit too pejorative there, maybe? Or? No, you're not. And I, I think what's happened is that a fantastic job has been done to raise awareness of sepsis over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and maybe that required there to be relatively simple messages about what is sepsis and how it should be treated. And I think it could be argued that we're now at a point where we can, we can be smarter, we can be more nuanced we can appreciate that there are patients who have got infection, many, many have been labelled with sepsis who haven't got infection, but who genuinely have got infection, who are not that sick. And we can monitor them, certainly in the hospital setting, quite well. We've got the means to do that. And we don't necessarily have to rush in with aggressive treatments. Now, the subset of people who have particular vulnerability or are developing shock, that's a different story. But they're quite a small number. Um, and the, the general population with infection or, or even ordinary sepsis don't have to be treated so uh, quickly or, or aggressively. And I think we now need to start helping people understand those differences. And I think some of the measures that have been brought in um, nationally and, and maybe even internationally have probably been helpful in terms of uh, encouraging people to, to be rapid in both uh, seeing patients, reviewing patients with, with, with sepsis or potential sepsis and treating them. We need to back off a little bit now. now I mean, I'm hearing of, of doctors who um, actually get complaints put in about them because they've been to see a patient where the diagnosis is unclear but a datex is written because they haven't written up the antibiotics because the message has gone out so strongly that that's the only thing to do in, the, in these cases. And we, I think we should be moving past that. Mm. Ron, we need to back off a little bit. Well, no, I, I disagree on that. I mean, the message to the public has always been just ask, could it be sepsis? This is not go to hospital and demand a broad spectrum antimicrobial. This is present yourself and ask a question, because time and time again, when we see episodes of sepsis, which typically arises in the community, and that's possibly why some of the studies show equivocal results, because they're largely hospital-focused, all we're asking them to do is to be empowered to ask that question because when we look back at untoward events where sepsis has arisen in the community, they've perhaps been assessed by health professionals in the community, but they haven't felt empowered to ask that question to challenge. So I think it is appropriate. We have to be mindful that this is, amongst the global antimicrobial usage, a relatively small component of antimicrobial usage. And whilst I absolutely accept, accept that there are different cohorts, some of which will need urgent antibiotics and many of whom won't. At the moment, we still don't understand which is which. And furthermore, at the moment, for example, whether it be an operational definition or an official definition, we apply the same definition of sepsis to somebody who's 18 years old and an athlete as somebody who's 88 years old with cardiorespiratory disease. Those definitions are largely built in microbiology, sorry, in laboratory data as well as physiological data, each of which change with age and comorbidities. And I think we'll get a lot better in the future at understanding at an individual patient level the phenotype of a patient that does require those urgent antimicrobials. So I do think we'll target, but I think we need better information and better ways of using it before we can safely target. And this is against a background where we're seeing in this country uh, a rise in E. coli bacteremia and a rise in Staph aureus bacteremia, and we don't know why. And we've been looking really hard to try and find out the reason. It's been going on about the last six, seven years now. Um, the, we were very successful in reducing MRSA. We were very successful in reducing Clostridium difficile infections. We've made no impact on these two Organisms. In fact, I think the latest data shows uh, free coli is up 5% uh, just in, in the last year, but we know the rise has been much, much greater than that and in the last well, few years. And that's a 5% rise, despite enormous efforts yeah. over the last two or three years to get them to reduce. Of course, a lot of those are community onset. So you know, perhaps less than half are actually hospital onset. But what is it? Is it hydration? Is it that GPs are, because of... Being encouraged to give less antibiotics, they're not giving enough. 
Are we uh, giving the right antibiotics? Or is it the fact that the, a lot of the urinary pathogens are becoming more resistant? And so the straightforward antibiotics that people have been given don't work. Um, recently, GPs have switched over their first choice antibiotic. Has that made a difference? So far, we haven't, we haven't got to the bottom of that problem, and it is worrying. And I just wanted to return to the um, issue around um, identifying these patients and treating them. It, it, it felt to me, obviously, as a non-clinician layman, that uh, what you're really both talking about is clinical decision-making and, and the ability of a clinician to act effectively outside a protocol in the best interest of the patient in front of them. Have we gone a bit too far away from that? sort of core relationship of the clinician and the patient, whether they be nurse or doctor, and instead relying on uh, a protocol or a golden hour um, belief applied to everybody. Is that, is, is that, have we done too much of, the, of that? Well, I would say that that has been, been the steer, and, and maybe we need to get to this point before we stand back a little bit and, and, and think again. And Ron said he sort of disagreed with my view. I, I thought he agreed, actually, because I, I thought you were saying that we need to be more nuanced um, and we need to f compare the 18-year-old athlete with the elderly person who's frail and got comorbidities and think about them differently, and I think that's absolutely right. Uh, and our current systems aren't based around that kind of thinking quite often, so we do need to be more nuanced. And for the 18-year-old with an athlete who's in, a, in the hospital who is being monitored every few hours, we probably can afford to stand off. With the elderly immunocompromised person, maybe we can't, and we need to do a, a whole bunch of things, including investigations, to determine the cause of their problem, which may be infection, but as Peter has pointed out, quite often it turns out not to be. So we always need to bear in mind that even if we are treating sepsis, and it seems like the right thing to do, we need to have a back of our minds that there might be something else going on and, and, and come back and, and reaffirm uh, the, the diagnosis. So my disagreement was not that we need, we don't need to be more nuanced. Of yeah. course we do. Yeah, yeah. My disagreement is that we have the resources to be, allow us to do that now, and that the time is now to do that, because I don't believe that's true. We, we don't have a biomarker, we don't have a panel of biomarkers that tell us in which patient we need to act rapidly. We don't yet have the molecular techniques that allow us to reliably, at the point of care, determine firstly whether there are bacteria present, secondly whether they're pathogenic and third, thirdly their resistance profiles and I think it, we absolutely need to move toward that. The other point on which we absolutely agree is where senior clinical judgment with 20 years experience under a clinical belt is available any protocol, any pathway becomes redundant because if a senior clinician feels a patient is critically unwell and it's likely to be down to an infection, that should always be treated as an infection and always be considered as sepsis until proven otherwise. The, where pro pathways and protocols come in is in organisations like mine, a little district general hospital in the West Midlands, we don't always have that senior clinical judgment available and our junior clinicians don't have the ability to apply nuanced healthcare and sometimes they need to, to decision support tools. Peter, on that last point um, around sort of less experienced staff making these decisions, do you, from from your point, position, um, do you see people making poor decisions at, at that level? And it, and what should we be doing about that? From because obviously you're a, you sit across this divide of both trying to sort of um, guard the antimicrobial resistance mm -hmm. issue, but whilst at the same time needing to treat patients who have sepsis and so you see both sides just talk us through what you're thinking so the, the more junior the clinician the more likely they seem to be to give broad spectrum antibiotics and that not only applies to intensivists it applies to microbiologists so so my registrars will tend to advise the broader spectrum because they're worried about covering everything that it could possibly be causing the problem in the patient and all missing something and it's it's entirely understandable because this is something that comes with years of experience. And if you could get to the situation where every patient suspected of having sepsis, fulfilling the criteria, an experienced clinician, intensivist or, or a medical clinician, can see the patient, make the decision, we would be in a lot better place than we are. Unfortunately, life being what it is, 
we have to train up people, we have to, people have to get experience. We're going to have junior people making their decisions in the night. Uh, so I think if that's the case, we need to get better at changing the antibiotics the next day to something that the experienced clinician feels is more appropriate. And I think we're not very good at that at the moment. No. I, I think, Ron, you, you mentioned uh, um, there about the need to become a bit more uh, smarter in how we, are, we, don't, we lack the ability to identify some of these uh, pathogens. Uh, we hear a lot about genomics and technological solutions. And uh, Is there anything down the line that any, either, any of you are aware of that might help us out with this? Are we going to be able to do this? Uh, anytime sooner or unfortunately are we stuck with where we are that, that people are effectively having to make the, the best judgment they can in difficult circumstances? So from my perspective there are there are two avenues with which to answer this question. The, the first is the risk stratification, you know, the individualised patient care in whom do we need to deliver antimicrobials rapidly. We're getting much better at understanding the disease process, we're getting much better at understanding how biomarkers can affect us but back down to the cohort specific model we have a wealth of data in the NHS, physiological data, we have laboratory data, which includes but is not exclusively microbiological data, we have pre-hospital data, GP data, even patient reported symptomatology. To allow those data sets to talk to each other and to apply pattern recognition to understand what the phenotype of that 18 year old who does actually need urgent antimicrobials is, we'll start to get to a better place. And the second is in pathogen identification. Molecular techniques for pathogen identification are certainly there, but we haven't yet evaluated whether they can be delivered at the point of care, how that impacts on clinician behaviour, whether it positively or negatively impacts on prescribing behaviour and so forth. We just need to get a lot better at understanding the heterogeneity of this condition. Mm. Which sounds to me like we need to be training staff a little bit in some of these issues, getting them better able to maybe make these judgments. Could we be doing more in that, in education and training? Is that the one solution to some of these issues, John? I mean, it might be. I mean, I guess what we're talking about is critical thinking and um, putting together lots of data. Now, the data's got to be available in the first place, and currently, quite often, it isn't. People are operating with a, uh, a pretty small amount of data, especially in the community. Uh, or in the emergency department when the patient first presents. Um, and, and I guess also helping people be exposed to different conditions. And unfortunately, for a number of years now, we've had a training which has tended to push people into uh, particular disciplines relatively early, so people don't always get the exposure to seeing the range of cases that, they're, that, they might, that might be out there, which is probably pretty important. Um, which is why quite often the, the default is to call in the ICU people and they themselves have their own biases built in um, f f f through that experience. So, so I think we could do more and maybe technology can help us with that just in terms of the way that images or films or virtual reality might be able to help with, with, with some of that stuff. And if I may, I think another point here is that often when we are choosing to withhold antimicrobials and we might choose to deliver them at a later point, what we're looking for is direction of travel of an individual's patient's clinical course. Now, we have the luxury in critical care of continuous monitoring, continuous presence of nursing staff particularly, but also medical staff. On the ward, even in the acute medical unit, that luxury is not always available. And we have guidelines from the Royal Colleges themselves that say that the minimum standard of frequency of observations is every 12 hours. We have guidelines that say you must do a post-take ward round within 16 hours. There's a lot of opportunity for the direction of travel to change in that intervening space. And the safety of a withholding strategy in patients with a strong suspicion of infection is not yet clear. So, and perhaps I could, have, I mean, like a lot of people, we're, we're working on uh, how we might develop uh, that kind of in between the routine monitoring um, with wireless monitoring, for example, that, yeah. that ward patients and even home, home patients at home can wear that will pick up changes in vital signs almost instantaneously uh, and would include patient self report as well. Absolutely. And taking this theme of uh, innovations, uh, Peter, what, what innovations are going on in the microbiology world to try and um, balance some of these risks that, that we're dealing with? So the, the diagnostics are coming leaps and bounds at the moment, but we're still not in a place where I want them to be. 
We, we can now have kits that will identify quite a large array of organisms in the blood within an hour or two of the uh, kit being activated. Um, the trouble is that they will identify four or five different pathogens sometimes, uh, and say you're looking at sputum or other, um, and we won't know necessarily, as a microbiologist, which of those is the important bug, which is the one we need to treat. So the risk might be then that you say, oh, well, we better cover all of them, so we better give a broader spectrum antibiotic to cover all of them. Much more useful would be if these new kits could tell us not necessarily what the organism is exactly, but at least what it is sensitive to, what antibiotics should be used against it, and are there any major resistance uh, genes present. That would be better. Even if we got that, we have still got a problem because the logistics of transporting samples to the laboratory have lagged well behind the innovation. So it still takes sometimes many hours for a blood culture to get from the ward to the laboratory. Um, even if you have an on-site laboratory, it may take hours for it to get onto the machine in the laboratory. So we need point-of-care tests. We need tests in the intensive care unit, in the A&E. Then how do you man them? Who's going to man them? Who's going to pay for them? There's lots of things to work out. I mean, I mean, we're now into sort of organisational challenges, aren't we? And I think I'd be very interested to hear from all three of you about, about these issues because um, as a journalist, I see cases all the time of miscommunication, of delays getting, getting results from the lab, etc., etc. I mean, the, these are often at the root of the sort of more controversial errors in, in deteriorating patients. We often find there are these elements. If I was a manager watching this webinar now, what, what would you be saying to them in terms of how they organise their, their systems and processes to get it right for the patient and the clinician working on the front line? I don't know who would like to pick that up. But. I think what we're really talking about here is a reliable, rapid detection of deterioration in all its forms, pretty often sepsis, but, but not just sepsis and the ability to deliver a reliable, rapid response to deterioration or suspected deterioration when it occurs, 24-7, in, in, in every hospital. And some of the difficulty around reliable detection is, as, as Ron has pointed out, that some patients are monitored pretty infrequently, and they tend to be monitored mostly by uh, the lowest paid and quite often the the least trained members of staff, healthcare assistants on the wards, doing a fantastic job, but uh, not being able to put much resource into that important thing. And our ability across the country to have people who are always available to see those patients when they are, when, when they are escalated is pretty shaky. Um, and, and there are often quite big delays in terms of someone coming to see the patient and indeed if they need progression into a higher level of care um, they're being a bit available for that in, in the critical care unit and we know that uh, around the world we, we have fewer critical care beds available than pretty well any other Western, Western country. So uh, I think some of this is about the fact that the priority for most managers most of the time in most hospitals is more about patient flow. They might espouse patient safety, um, but it's patient flow that is really the discussion at most meetings of most managers most of the time, unless there's a disaster and, and things are different then. But a lot of the time we get away with it or we don't, we, we don't report the disasters as often as we, as we should. Let me, let me just bring Ron in there on, on, on these points. What about, from your perspective in a trust, what would you like to see organisations put in place to, to help doctors tackling sepsis coming through the door but needing at the same time to not just hit everybody with um, antimicrobials which may, may not be helpful? So building on the previous points, I mean, just as we have to give the right antibiotic, it's not just about antibiotics being given within a certain number of minutes. It's the right antibiotic. We have to get the right clinician to the patient. And it's very convenient for organisations to say, well, OK, we're going to measure 
how well, how reliably, and how frequently we do the news scores, for example. They'll measure how quickly a clinician attends the patient, but they won't often measure the seniority of that clinician, they won't assess the clinical judgment of that clinician, and frequently what's missing is that first attending clinician is often relatively junior from whatever discipline they arise. The escalation to a more senior clinical judgment, a more senior level of care, is poorly addressed. I think we have to embrace technology in this process. There are systems available to automate, to, to pattern recognise patients who are deteriorating using the new score as a baseline and to automatically escalate when actions have not been taken as a result. And wearable technology, as has been mentioned, will be also instrumental in helping to increase the frequency of observations. But I think it, it's also about breaking down silos. It, it, it's also about, for example, with point of care technology in pathogen identification. It's collaborative and partnership work in between infection specialists and frontline clinicians to enable us to bring such technologies into the point of care setting but mitigate against naive decision making by the frontline clinicians, perhaps through an algorithmic approach um, to such new information, such novel information in the, in the point of care environment, or perhaps through good old fashioned telephone calls to ratify the information and make sensible decisions. So I think there's a lot we need to do. Um, a lot of this is resource driven and is constrained by a lack of availability of senior staff, but there is also a certain reluctance to embrace new technology to support decision making. Mm. That's, that's the last point's interesting, I think. Uh, John, you were going to say something. Then. Well, I'd just like to add one thing. So uh, I think one of the things that we could do, and maybe could do quite quickly, is much more easily enable patients themselves or their carers or relatives to play a part in the recognition and, and escalation of deterioration or potential deterioration. And that's not something that we've picked up across the NHS, other than perhaps in paediatrics where parents quite often uh, do, do that kind of thing. So enabling patients themselves to raise the alarm ought not to be that difficult. Uh, it's a cultural change um, and I think could have great benefits. Agreed. Yeah. One area that we found successful recently um, was we would we tested on, on same ITU um, a diagnostic test that could say 99.9% there was no bacterial viral or fungal pathogen in this sample of blood and it did that within a few hours of taking the blood and we it didn't affect the initial decision to go on to antibiotic but the following day when we said to the clinician, look, actually there's no organism in this, the clinician said, mm, yeah, I'm not sure if there is, this patient is septic anyway, um, stop the antibiotic or de-escalate the antibiotic to something you know, not meropenem. And that worked in 25% of the patients. So there was some, a relatively simple test that could have a big effect on the antibiotic prescribing if people believe in the test. And just following that thought, if that was replicated uh, across the NHS from a, uh, a microbiology point of view, would that help us with the, the AMR challenge? It would certainly help with the AMR challenge, yeah. yes. Uh, but of course there's a lot of ifs before that. <laughs> there's always lots of ifs. Right. I, I wanted to ask you, Peter, we've talked a lot on, on sepsis, but I think it's fair to say uh, you know, sepsis has had a huge focus and awareness. And I, I wanted to give you the chance to just talk about whether you felt that antimicrobial resistance and the issues around that were getting as sufficient interest and in raising awareness among clinicians as perhaps sepsis has? Or is it the sort of poor relation of, of that? I think, um, I mean, the current chief medical officer has put a lot of mileage into uh, antimicrobial resistance. There's been a lot of research. There's been a lot of uh, activity with WHO globally. Um, and I think there's, uh, there's been even government focus on AMR. So I think, no, I don't think it's a poor relation. I think it's getting a lot of attention at the moment, and it is a very great threat. Um, I just wish we were a little more successful at reducing AMR than we have been. And that's really not going to happen until we can get a control on the level of broad-spectrum antimicrobial prescribing. In general practice, they've, they've managed a huge reduction in their empirical antibiotic uh, prescribing, and that's been very successful. 
we've, we've achieved some reductions in, in, in hospital care as well, but it's nowhere near enough. And what's driving it up all the time is that we're getting so much better at, as I say, keeping people alive. People who, who are, have got very, very severe illnesses and now increasingly are coming in from abroad or sometimes other parts of this country with multi-resistant organisms that are really difficult to treat. Sometimes we can't treat at all. We're coming very close to the end of our time, but I wanted to ask um, all of you, if there's a clinician watching this webinar and they think to themselves, what do I do tonight when I'm faced with a patient that I'm not quite sure they meet the protocols, but I'm not sure, what do they need to do? Is it, is it give the antibiotics within the first hour run or is it wait and see? John, or you know, who, what, what would be your view and advice to that clinician? So I think as a system we need a pragmatic and balanced approach. We, we all accept that sepsis is a significant problem and that there are a cohort of patients in whom delaying antimicrobial therapy is quite likely to cause harm. We all accept that there's a lot we don't know and so at the present, unless we have 20 years of a clinical experience under your belt, doesn't have to be 20 years, unless you have a lot of clinical experience, you might err on the side of treating. Now that's not an inappropriate thing to do, providing you're sense checking yourself, providing you're looking to available resources, looking to available tools to support you in that decision making. But the important thing is, if there's any doubt and you don't have the clinical experience to make that judgment call, find someone who does. Peter, final thoughts from you. What, what do the clinicians need to be thinking about? I think if, if a patient has gone on to very broad spectrum antibiotics, because you can't exclude that as a necessary uh, event, you need to be better on your reviewing the antibiotic the next day and either narrow the spectrum or stop the antibiotic altogether if you don't think it's sepsis. Don't just keep on going with the antibiotic to complete the course. John, a final thought, final bit of a word of advice. So, particularly in the hospital where maybe there is backup to be, to be had or should be available, uh, I think we can more often, with more patients, do some watching and waiting. So the first requirement is to assess the patient properly and get as much information as you can about the patient, uh, both in terms of their presentation, but also their inherent vulnerabilities, comorbidities or immunosuppression or whatever it is. But there, there is a fairly significant group of people that we treat as septic who turn out not to have sepsis. and are actually not very ill and we can watch and wait with with a proportion of those patients now if they get sick again or um, become sick then that's a different different thing but if we're monitoring them properly then then we may be able to lay off that entirely or indeed decide that there's a different problem uh, completely that needs to be treated well gentlemen thank you very much for your time i think um, that's been an interesting discussion hopefully some food for thought for you guys at home we've heard uh, about some interesting discussions around the protocols, clinical decision making, the risks of antimicrobial resistance and the challenges that clinicians face on the front line as well as managers running the hospitals around which they work. Hopefully we'll be discussing all of these issues at the Patient Safety Congress where I hope to welcome you all to Manchester for that discussion and I'm sure we'll return to this issue again. Thank you very much. <laughs>